Okay, should we get going? I think the uh, the topic is uh, shifting priorities and changing environment, but let's not be uh, let's not be too slavish to the topic. Um, however, the however the discussion can be helpful for people. I'm happy to provide a, a venture perspective, or would love to hear from you guys as well. Does anybody have a question to kick it off? <coughs> Um, I, I have a question. It's something I've been talking about with uh, the team. Um, we're thinking about, so we're building a, an application called Grow that helps people easily give high quality feedback at work. And we've actually seen an uptick in demand for our product now that people are working remotely because we're built into Slack and Slack is seeing like 20% month over month growth. And one of the things we've been talking about is uh, do we kind of like soft pivot? Do we do a 10 degrees difference to help support some of the work remotely use cases? Or do we kind of look at our existing product thus far? We've been incorporated for 10 months, so still relatively new as a company as kind of like sunk cost and say, okay, the world has changed. Do we reimagine what we're doing completely? Obviously the answer probably isn't binary, but I'm curious from a, from a, from your point of view, um, how would you advise a company looking at that sort of situation? I'm happy to give my point of view. If others want to jump in too, that'd be great. Um, I don't know the specifics of the situation, but my sense is, uh, and this is anecdotal, but um, there have been enough kind of anecdotal data points here. I, I do think that what we're all going through now will represent a change in the way of doing business. I used to jump on a plane to go to one meeting in San Francisco all the time and fly back. I'm not going to be doing that in the future. I think right. Zoom has performed so well during this uh, this time. I think it surprised a lot of people um, and, and surprised a lot of institutions, which is maybe even more important. Um, so I, I do think these new tools for working like Zoom, like Slack, like some of the workflow tools, like um, project management tools, I think they will hit a new normal that will be up. And so I, I would be prepared to bet my company on that. That's not the same as saying I would completely pivot the business. I, I don't understand what your business is, but I would definitely feel comfortable taking the bet that this isn't a, um, a three month blip that will return to the level that it was before. I think it's going to be a permanent shift that will, um, uh, uh, over pivot and swing back, but it'll swing back to a level that was significantly higher than it was previously. Thank you. That that's super helpful. That's pretty similar to how I've been thinking about it. Um, to try to position ourselves to take advantage of of some of the new normal. So thank you. Great, Lauren. Uh, uh, I see you jumped in, or is that Charlie? I jumped in to try to send uh, video permissions to everybody because it seems like some people are having trouble with that. So I just went down the list okay. and invited everyone to start their video. Great. And Lauren, we, we just jumped into a conversation. Is that, uh, that, that the way we should play it? Yes. Great. Okay. It's kind of an open Q&A conversation. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Anybody else have any advice for Ryan, particularly if it differs? I'll chime in. Hi, I'm uh, Lee, uh, CEO and founder of Confetti. Uh, very fortunate because uh, Comcast is an investor of ours. Um, I have a kind of a piggyback question to it, but I can also share how we're looking at uh, this entire space right now. So uh, we, uh, just to kind of give you some perspective on, on who we are, uh, we are a tech platform that uh, on a before current health companies put together their events. So you can put together an entire multi-vendor experience, a uh, full customization online in just a couple clicks. Um, naturally, the hospitality industry was hit really hard. So when all of this was going down, we were very nervous to see what is the effect that's going to it, it take on our company. Um, and at least for the way that we, we are still a very small company, uh, seed stage, uh, have about uh, 
we downsized a little bit, but um, the way that we looked at the first few weeks is we uh, put a, a goal that we felt like a, a product that we wanted to put out into the market that we actually believed in, which uh, resonates in, in the world of virtual events. And we decided to take a little bit more of a not put all of our uh, eggs in one basket approach, but really take it week by by week, um, which we did get a little bit of, of pushback on uh, in the beginning. But ultimately, it resulted that we were we're, we're kind of internally a kind of company that we sell things and we even pre-sell things that don't exist and wait for us to get revenues. And when we get revenues, we start putting the building box in place. Uh, to go in that direction and waiting for evidence and data points to understand whether this is something we should invest in more or invest in less. Um, and ultimately, as a company, what we're trying to think and build, and Ryan, this is kind of what I, 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 I this is the way that we're looking at it internally, is um, ideally that product should be something that at least has some kind of form of, of value uh, even if life returns back to normal, and if if life doesn't return back to normal, that obviously it would it would provide uh, value for for now. So um, we're trying to find that right balance between the two, and wait for a little bit more data points and make these decisions uh, on a week by week basis. And that's that's our company. I don't know if all, all the large companies can afford to do the same uh, same thing. Um, I would say that similar to, to Ryan's question, uh, my thought is like, where, where do investors think in, um, like we're kind of going a, a little bit uh, off track to like, um, to essentially accommodate just what we are hoping for revenue goals. So in the past, we were very focused on only uh, getting sales from uh, corporates, but uh, we're also just organically getting sales from consumers that's not affecting our operations and not affecting uh, our technology. So I'm kind of curious on, on your thoughts, Andrew, on um, should founders really just do whatever it takes to get the KPIs that they need hit and make the money that they need to hit? Um, or should, uh, should we still stay laser focused on who we were pre-corona? I don't think there's any good answer. I do think there's a kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And the first need is just survival. So whatever the business needs to do to survive is, is priority number one. If, if companies are beyond that stage and it's more like, okay, well, how do we trade off growth versus unit economics? Let's say that that's a conversation a few of our companies are having. I, I think, uh, I liked your response to Ryan's question, actually, because consistent with some of my comments in the panel, I think taking big and irreversible decisions around the business in the next four weeks probably doesn't make a ton of sense because we're going to learn so much more in the next four to six weeks. So keeping options open and driving optionality seems to me to be the best thing you can be doing for the business at the moment. An optionality might be you know, some of the discussions around following staff that we've seen, but it doesn't have to be as kind of straight down in the middle as that. It could be, you know, uh, firing customers or building new products or pricing in different ways. There's all sorts of creativity one can apply to the business. Um, so in general, I think framing it as, okay, we're in the middle of the firestorm at the moment. Let's, let's see what happens when things settle down a little bit, and then we can make some more permanent decisions around changes in direction. Um, I think to pick up the thread that I was saying before, if we're beyond survivability, we know we have a business, we know we can course correct to get to an amount of runway that we feel comfortable with, then I think the discussion is becomes more of a classic one, which is what are the goals I'm aiming for, the milestones I'm aiming for in, in order to tee up the next round of financing. And you might well want to revisit what those milestones are. Those milestones may look very different now. They may have been super growth oriented before. Now they might um, blend growth with unit economics or with customer retention or with cash flow metrics. I, I, think, I think that's the kind of discussion one wants to have, but I think it can be framed classically, which is we have a certain amount of runway. We want to tee up the next round of financing. 
we need a certain set of milestones in order to have a good conversation around that, we should revise those milestones or at least revisit them and recheck them. Thank you. Andrew, I've got a question if I can jump in. Please. Um, we raised a small bit of capital end of last year and with the intentions of raising funds, still the intentions of, and we'll raise funds late this year. But I'm curious, uh, you know, the, the typical is, you know, plan on six months to close your round. Um, with the thoughts in the panel earlier, the idea that checks might be a little bit smaller if you don't already have a relationship. Um, we're only talking, you know, in, in the size of things people were talking about a second ago, we're talking about a $5 million total raise-ish. Um, are you still, is your gut telling you that a raise this fall is going to still be a six month close or is that actually going to be accelerated now with the concept that maybe there's a little bit more zoom up front, there's a little bit more of a, a set of filters that, that you all are figuring out how to apply virtually um, in advance? Um, there's a few things there. And let me just say up front, I'm, I'm happy for this to be a series of questions and to provide answers. But if others want to jump in with perspectives and pieces of advice, pl please do. I, I don't mean this to be a uh, unilateral conversation. So, so I, 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 think, I think Charlie rightly settled on six months of runway being in some ways the most difficult place from which to operate because if you have six months of runway, you really need to be thinking about raising now. And raising now is tremendously difficult. My personal advice would be, it probably doesn't make that much sense, even with only six months runway, to be doing a ton of activity now, except preparing materials and rethinking through milestones and so on. I think if you have, I don't know what your capital structure is like, but my first instinct would be to turn to my insiders and say, look, it, it, it's logical for you, my current investors, to push us out beyond the worst effects of the current crisis. And so even if that only pushes us out another eight months or so, let's do that as a bridge or let's do it as a priced round or let's just add to the previous round of financing because we're going to have a much better conversation in 14 months time than we are in six months time, which is effectively one month's time because we got a raise pretty much immediately. So I, I'd be looking to, I'd be pulling every lever I could to try and get out of running out of capital in six months time. And I'd be relatively rigorous about that, even to the extent of, you know, um, shortening my team and maybe firing customers, wh wh whatever I needed to do. I, I think even getting out to, 10 or 11 months would pay, pay dividends. So that, that's how I think about it. I think, I think that you are gonna face a constrained environment if you try and go out and raise in the next month or so. I think there will definitely be investors that are willing to engage, but I think it's gonna be a subset. I think there will at least be, I look at, I look at my own partnership, which is nine investing partners. Some partners are happy to deploy, like personally happy to deploy capital without having spent time, physical time with the founders, and some aren't. So even internally within my own group, there is a subset of investors that are happy to engage and a subset that isn't. And I think that will play out across the industry. So the further you can get, the greater the aperture of investors that I think you'll be able to engage with and the better the round will be. And apparently we're pretty comfortable just taking your brain. And what? I said, and apparently we're very comfortable just picking your brain. Yeah, yes. I can Anybody else with, with thoughts? Yeah, another. please. Um, so I'm, I wonder if other founders do this, but um, I feel, I feel like the word lucky, I kind of don't like the word lucky because um, it's, not something I can control, uh, but I feel very lucky that we as a company found ourselves in a situation where we didn't spend the majority of the money that we raise and we were able to make certain uh, uh, like limitations to our spending, some cuts that allowed us to very easily get to that 18 months of runway 
Um, but I do often just run simulations of what would my decisions have been if I did have six months of runway and what would I do if I didn't come up with an interesting pivot that allowed us to make money uh, within basically a week of, of Corona hitting. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like, where, where will this change as, as founders continue to raise money? Are, do you think that there's going to be less investments out there and now we're going to create maybe a, uh, a, a kind of a untouched pool of money that's saved for a rainy day in case uh, things go wrong? Is that going to be an element of fundraising now? Um, or is it that every time we run into one of these big challenges, we're going to need to invent from, from the ground up on the fly? Are you asking whether investors are going to be looking for, in effect, additional insurance policies upon the next raise? So flexibility, reserved capital, that kind of thing? Um, I, I would say that, I don't know the terminology of it, but um, <laughs> I, would, I would say like as founders, like do we need to have a pool of money? And is that something that both investors and I, we should have mutual interest? So is that something we should both work to together, having that pool of money saved for a rainy day? Uh, and I, I, I didn't know the terms that you'd called it, but is that something that we should all be optimizing for the same way as we all have option pools because it's something that we set in place right before the round? Do we have a, a financial pool for that rainy day that continues to accumulate as the company grows? And is that going to be now something that we factor into our future fundraising rounds? For me, just practically, that, that pool of capital is equivalent to runway. So if I want to reserve a pool of capital, it just means I have to fundraise earlier. And therefore I face a trade-off between, can I hit the milestones I need to have a successful financing and keep that reserve cash um, on my balance sheet? Or do I need to dip into that reserve cash in order to hit my milestones? And that, that feels like a tactical decision that you can make as you approach that kind of level of reserves that you want. I don't think I don't think most investors are going to be looking at the balance sheets of companies and saying, wow, this company has 12 months of runway still on the balance sheet and they're raising now. I give them extra brownie points for that. Um, I think it's going to be a, a, probably a, a reasonably calculable trade-off between should I go out and raise now when I have plenty of runway left and therefore lots of ability to handle uncertainty? Or do I need to use that capital to hit my milestones and then provably be, um, be, uh, be an attractive candidate for a next round? So basically we need to innovate on, on the fly. Go if, if we were stuck in a situation where COVID hit and there's six months of runway left, you're really left with the decision of hopefully your metrics are good, you can successfully raise money. And if your metrics are not good, you gotta make the hard decisions, cut people off and stay low until your head above water. There's clearly a huge element of luck here. Clearly. We talk about our portfolio falling the right side of the luck line and the wrong side of the luck line. Yeah. And, you know, did, did you close around just before Corona hit or did you expect to close around within a month after Corona hit? And it's devastating for companies that fall on the wrong side of the line. Now, um, if the companies are good companies, insiders should step forward and make sure that those companies are protected. Um, but, uh, but it's still probably not going to be the financing that the company was looking for previous to Corona arriving. There is a big element of luck here. I, I mean, my only other thought is I've been, as an entrepreneur, I worked through the 2001 crisis. And then as an investor, I worked through 2008 and the current one. And, um, you know, the, the common theme is y you just have to, you just have to manage the runway as elegantly or even aggressively as you possibly can. I think the recoveries from each of those three events will look vastly different. And we don't know what the recovery from this will look like. I'm personally pretty pessimistic. I think, you know, I think the economy will has squeezed a lot of people out of unemployment and 
will struggle to reintegrate them because companies will find different ways to work like zoom or you know just from you know if they had to let 20 percent of their people go i think emerging from this even in a year's time they probably won't pick up that 20 percent. they might pick up five percent because they'll have found new ways of working so i think the economy is going to be pretty bruised after this event and i'm reasonably pessimistic about a quick recovery um, and so for me, it's all about runway and unit economics and really being in control of your own destiny to the extent that possible. And in something you just said, I was going to kind of jump in after you leave, but you just said at the end of that, I think that brings me right back to it. And, and the gray in my beard will show that I've lived through those economic times as well. Um, and I'm in the construction tech space, our company, um, and launched out of the construction business. Um, so it'll be an interesting rebound and probably we, we expect, um, multiple little rebounds, uh, of work, uh, before things stabilize. But in our tech space, uh, very hot vertical in the last several years, what we see as is some level of correction, if you will. And I, and I, you know, being a founder, going through the struggles of it, understanding them, I, I don't ever want to disparage another founder. I don't know what's on their side of the sheet, but but we did see lots of people open up offices and hire lots of staff and do lots of things um, while they were still figuring out their their market and their and their and their business. And I think um, it's the one thing that you know, I guess being blue collar construction guys as founders, we were very conservative and and, uh, and came out of the gate very lean and stayed very lean. Um, I, I hope it's a, a, a thought process that we all look at how lean can we run um, and optimize what we're doing versus, you know, just grabbing a lot of good talent that's out there and, and throw, rolling the dice with a lot of money that got dropped in the, in the piggy bank. Um, yeah. And I know that sounds like I'm preaching to the choir and I'm an old guy and I feel like my dad as I say all these things, but it, it is, <laughs> um, you know, having lived through those times and, and you know, kind of grew up in an era of, of um, you know, one Carper family kind of concept. Um, you know, maybe that's not a bad perspective for at least a little while um, to come through this in a, in a better shape and it's going to make companies stronger. And I think that's the exciting part of coming through this is that there's going to be a lot of much more stable, firm, strong companies versus lots of um, gambles. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. I, I would say one thing that is a little bit different about this particular crisis is um, we've had such a bull run for so long. There are a lot of executives actually that haven't seen uh, seen a really bad time. Um, one of the features about 2008 was 2001 was so bad for the startup community that it still sucked in 2004. So when 2008 came along, there was still an institutional memory of how bad it was. But that's much less true because it's 12 years since the last really bad set of events. And there's a new generation of exec executives that weren't senior at the time. And that makes it a little bit, that makes this feel a little bit different. And I think adds to some of the inertia that I was thinking about earlier when um, entrepreneurs weren't adjusting to the new normal because they hadn't seen such a, such a, you know such swift changes in direction before. Any other questions or comments, Elizabeth, Nami, Eric? Anything you're wondering about? Wanted to ask the group. No, nothing. Nothing from me. This is Elizabeth. I'm sort of. I I, I actually started my company. Uh, fairly recently, about three months mm -hmm. ago. So I'm, I'm mostly interested on in hearing perspectives because I am in that situation where I have six months of runway. I did not exist way before coronavirus. So I, you know, it, there are limited options, uh, but I do be believe I do have um, um, the kernel of a really good company that can scale even in this situation. So I'm mostly just hearing from, from a lot of you guys that have been around for a little longer and, and what levers you guys uh, play with. But that's just sort of the perspective that I'm coming from. <laughs> okay, great. Any others, Chris, Carolyn, Christina? Uh, I'm, so, I'm actually 
as an MBA student, so I'm here to record and, and absorb as much as possible. So I'm currently interviewing for internships with startups and VC funds uh, on both coasts. So very happy to just listen and, and learn. It's almost perfect for you, Chris. You've come in at a time where you'll learn a lot. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, hi, everyone. This is Naomi. Um, I mean, uh, I don't uh, have specific questions per se, but adjusting to a changing environment is like ringing true to me right now as I'm feeding my seven month old. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, in terms of, yeah, you can hear him. In terms of, you know, um, just advice that I would love to get from um, everybody is on how can counter cyclical products uh, and startups that uh, have counter cyclical products um, you know really uh, make their mark uh, in this like really weird uh, ecosystem where they're not able to meet with investors but the product does really well yeah it's a it's a great question i think there are some real um opportunities here you heard charlie refer to it or maybe it was uh, maybe it was angus i think it was angus the the cost of cost i don't know whether it's a d2c business or not nami but the cost of customer acquisition at the moment is historically very low and so for a business that's just starting out elizabeth this may be relevant to you as well the ability to um, spend money effectively at a customer acquisition cost that really works for you guys and works for you net economics is really favorable at the moment so from, from that perspective there's lots of reasons to be to be optimistic because it is literally 50 or 60 percent of what it used to be before um, I, I think the other the other thing that I'd point to is and we've seen this a couple of times that journalists are desperate to um, counterbalance the slew of depressing um distressing news on corona with some some positive stories uh and there's a lot of bad business news as well and so to counter program that if you can get in touch with pr companies or journalists that you may know or routes into publications that you might be in touch with that actually want to cover a good news story uh, and something that provides a little bit of um, value and happiness or maybe it's just a good news business story i think you'll find that those routes are much more available to you than they than they were two or three months ago where it was uh you know it was all about um headline silicon valley companies or new york companies that uh, were employing a lot of people and growing like a weed so i i, I would i'd point to those three those two opportunities Right. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, just for uh, people who may not be familiar with uh, with my business, we are an AI platform that automatically negotiates your bank fees, credit card charges, and other kinds of loans with your financial institution. So anybody um, who ha who is suffering from three, four hour holds uh, with their financial institutions because of fees or whatever they might need, um, our software is able to help them. And we are a B2C company, so we are definitely seeing customer acquisition costs lowering in this environment so but uh, up until now we also have been in this like capital conservation cash conservation mode mm. you don't we we have the means to spend but you don't want to spend until you're clear about like what data you're seeing um so uh, at least like we're fortunate to have a comfortable runway and not have to worry too much about fundraising immediately but at the same time we never know how long this uh, crisis will linger right so all of those things i think we will see uh, acceleration on the customer acquisition front uh, from from our end in the next couple of months and pr we hadn't thought about it but uh, might be a good time to start those things as well yeah can I ask some of the entrepreneurs on the call, have you, or, or what are the difficult actions you've taken? Maybe you've had to let some of the team go or um, pull back on R&D or redeploy, um, redeploy staff to new roles to get through. It'd be interesting to hear some of the, some of the examples just for the benefit of others. I can chime in here. Um, so w obviously it was very difficult to let go of, of some of our employees, but we had to really take a look at like, okay, what is our next immediate milestone and what does our new life look like with virtual events? And 
what employees are crucial and going to actually help make this thing happen and which employees are uh, not actually going to support that cause. Um, and those are the ones that we ultimately uh, let go of. I think that as, as a company, one of our biggest things was we um, had raised the money in August and the first uh, six months-ish of coming out from, from that fundraise, we had a very specific goal to build technology um, that was supposed to be at like right before Corona used by our customers. And I think that um, the biggest thing as, as a company that we had to just very quickly let go of is that the hard work that we put in for the past six months is not going to be used any time soon in the way that we had wanted it to. Mm. Um, fortunately, we were able to use that same technology to sell something else, but a lot of that, uh, a lot of that hard work of of putting those pieces together was was gone um and so that was that was just something for us but we're uh we're we really try to look at it like robots without emotions and say this is this is the cost of doing business and um and we we can't our emotions can't really get in the way but uh that that was for us one of one of the hardest uh things is just being able to really quickly let go of all the things that all the expectations and hopes and the dreams that you had for something that you've been building and then realize that this pivot takes you potentially off track from all of that work lee how did you make that decision there's a series of hard decisions to make like what decision support did you get? Do you have a co-founder that you leaned on? Do you have friends, family, advisors? This is, I'm not, uh, by the way, I'm not fishing for Comcast Ventures compliments here. I'm, I'm genuinely interested. Um, for, for the laying off, um, we were, we were very black and white. I, I obviously it was a decision, um, that all of the, the board team made, but we didn't really, uh, there, there wasn't a debate over that. It was like, okay, us as an events company, especially like we have hard decisions that we need to make. And, um, as founders, I think that pretty much everyone here, we, we can't, we do everything for the sake of the company and its success. And, um, we had, I know I've heard like rumors about like mass zoom layoffs and I'm like horrified mm. by that, but we had very, uh, pretty quick hard to hearts with the people that we let go. And we had a tremendous amount of support from them, which was very, very uh, nice. So um, I think that, you know, with the right culture and with the right team, if you take that extra minute to realize you're dealing with a human and you want to make everything work and you want, you want to let them go so your company can be back with their head above water so you can hire them again as fast as possible. And when, when all of that communication is aligned, you, you build a really strong culture um, with, with the, the pivot to virtual events, um, I think that, and I like, I'm, I'm super grateful because ultimately, even though we're, we're in our board meetings, we, um, we really promote a lot of pushback and devil's advocate. So we have that kind of culture within our board meetings where every time I come with a yes, you know, I expect people to come back and say no. And that's the culture that, that we've built in our board meetings. So uh, our board meeting, when we came up with virtual events, had a lot of no's because that was, that's the way that we build our board meetings until. Uh, so I think ultimately um, we didn't really ha have a choice. Our conversation looked like, uh, do we just put a pause and hibernate on everything? Um, which uh, which we voted no because we believed in in the element of virtual events. We had enough. Ooh, I think I'm I'm running out of time. So we had enough uh, 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 customers that had asked us for virtual events. So we had an indication that it was working. We were we were feeling that it was worth the 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 trial. Um, and we said if we get paid for it, we'll continue. If we reach these certain benchmarks, we'll continue. If we don't, we'll need to make harder decisions in the next few weeks. And, and that's ultimately, we just relied on the data. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, well, well, it looks like we're returning to the main session. Thank you so much for all the uh, great questions and uh, I'll see you back in, the, back in the main room. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Bye guys.